I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, you know, uh, knowing that you all know this in a certain way because we're all women. Right? We tend to go one of two ways. We are either super permissive and just pretend it's all fine and then be pissed on the back end, right? Or we're super critical. So th that's how it usually goes, right? So I, when, when women are very competitive, they're very critical of each other. And when they want to be accepted, which we can talk about why it is that we, have, we want to be so accepting and permissive, right? then it's like, oh, you're great, you feel great. You know? And with the you feel great or yeah, you look great in those pants, right? you are essentially um, not doing anybody a service because you're not actually saying, look, you have no business wearing these pants. If somebody asks you, right? If you're going to shop with a girlfriend, she says, how are these pants on me? If you don't want to hurt her feeling, you're essentially setting up for failure out there in the world, so to speak. You can express quite hard emotions of all kinds and keep your heart open. So it's definitely possible to say no and be completely heart open. You don't have to keep your heart open, right? So for instance, well, I mean, you don't have to keep your heart open, but what we're mostly talking about is it's for your sake as much as it is for the other human, because when you close your heart, you lose the vital information, right? You're no longer capable of reading the information that comes after the no. And that's important both with uh, loved ones, right? So if we look at uh, being able to set proper boundaries, when you are with people who you love uh, or people who are friends of yours, but they must, uh, the, the boundaries need to be enforced, you don't want to end the relationship just because you enforce the boundary, right? So if somebody, you know, like comes and says, you know, can I borrow your car for the next week? Or, you know, I really love this beautiful ball gown that you have. Can I have it for my friend's wedding? Right? It's very hard to say no because this is somebody you like and she can't afford a ball gown, let's say, and, you know, you want her, you technically want her to have it. You just don't want it to get damaged. Right? So you're in a real conundrum. We can talk a little bit about why women particularly are in that conundrum in a second. But so for, this, for the bigger sake of the relationship, you will have to say no, unless you really don't care if the thing comes back trashed, right? But if you go, ah, I should say yes, but I don't want to because I like this thing and somebody's going to step on it and I paid so much money for it, but I'm so stingy and this is, I never wear this thing. I'm probably never going to wear it again. Somebody will, will throw water on it. You know, so all of this happens very, very, very fast while the question's asked. And so the knee jerk is to go, yes. And then of course she takes the thing. You already fucked up by the time she takes it. You're certainly fucked off when it comes back because even if it doesn't come back completely ruined, it will come back with more wear on it, right? And then your relationship to your girlfriend will erode because you're going to always go, well, you couldn't even take care of this thing and I paid so much for it. And da, 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 da. It's not really her fault. You gave it to her, yeah. right? But that's, that's how women destroy relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so the no in that moment is the no that preserves the relationship in the bigger picture, but it's going to frighten you in the short term. You know, I'm, I'm making this a totally arbitrary scenario, but you all know what I'm talking about. So in the short term, you're going to be afraid that she'll be upset with you and she will think those things you think about yourself in that moment. Like, I'm stingy, I have so much, she has so little, you know, all of those things that people usually also play you with because, you know, th that also happens. But that moment of... Um, saying no will preserve the long-term relationship. So when you say no and your heart doesn't close, you can be with your friend while she processes the information of the disappointment. And when you're just really there and you say, no, you know, this is one of my favorite things and if you bring it back ruined, it's, it's just not going to be good. Or 
no, I have sentimental attachment to this thing. I, I just can't part with it. She'll, you'll notice, because your heart is still with her, her thing. And if you can stay with that, it will most likely pass. Because most people, once a boundary is set, move right along. Right? And of course, you know, uh, there's all other kind of strategies of things that you can suggest or help with, or maybe you have something you don't mind lending, right? And you go, no, you can't have that one, but I have this one, right? There's all kinds of options available, but the, the, the open heartedness makes it so she's not going to feel rejected personally. It's just her request that's rejected. If you close your heart, while you reject the request, to her it's going to feel like a rejection of her. So that's one example that, that you could use, right? So that's a nice example. Um, if you are in a situation where you are potentially in a predatory situation, right, where somebody comes for you in a weird sexual way, or which happens to all women, you know, it's just like some guy. But when some guy comes for you, in you know, even if it's if it's not dangerous, you don't know that somebody comes for you inappropriately, and you have to go and and back them off or say a strong no. If you shut your heart down, you also lose your senses, and you're no longer able to feel what's happening afterwards, which puts you into greater danger. Right? And so uh, the ability to stay feeling, which is the openness of the heart, is the ability to also stay um, reactive to potential pitfalls in the aftermath. Yeah. And so that's why it's important to have the heart with the no. But when in doubt, you know, it's better to do a closed-hearted no than no no at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know... Some situations require a certain closure because you just don't want to deal with things. But it does diminish your uh, sensory perception and your um, spidey senses, right. right? And so it's mostly for the spidey senses you want to keep it up with people who are... The spidey senses, it's an American thing. You know what Spider-Man, you know, like that. The, sixth it's the sixth sense, you know, your spidey senses is what the Americans say. Um, you know, your kind of supernatural, intuitive senses, which is nothing else but full feeling awareness. You know? So th those would be some, thing, some reasons to practice the very sharp, very full-on, open-hearted no. And like, for instance, another one and, uh, that, that would be when you are asking how gnarly and, and loud can it get, if you would, you know, see your toddler, your daughter once was a toddler, do something like she's about to run on the street and there's a tram coming, your no isn't uh, a lack of love. It's, you know, but it has to be really sharp and really loud. And your child might start crying in the aftermath and you grab it, you know, off the road. And you, you, know, you, you just really, but it, it's not a lack of love. And of course, in that moment, when the, the, it's because of the heart yeah. that you have to be really harsh. Right? So. And some people don't say no because they don't want to close their heart towards somebody, yeah. which is the other side of it. You know, because they prioritize the, the relationship or the feeling of the relationship over the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the reasons why women tend to have less boundary, boundaries than men and a harder time setting boundaries is um, because we are biologically uh, required to be high in agreeableness. Essentially, a circle of women is the oldest uh, and, and, and deepest archetypal force in women because that's how it's always been, right? Men would come and go by the function that they were out hunting. Let's talk the early cave days or tribal days or, you know, even people wandering the steppe or, so, or the savanna or something. Men were the ones out hunting and fighting and exploring, and women were the ones uh, gathering, preparing, you know, or I should say gathering. Uh, if in hunt, you know, in hunter-gatherers, the women usually gathered, the men hunted. Um, 
or in the farmer, farmer societies, it was also mostly the women harvesting. So you had women uh, process food, raise children, deal with animals. You had men out there fighting, defending, uh, exploring, and that meant men had a high rate of attrition based on that. Women had a high rate of attrition based on childbirth, but um, you needed other women to stay alive. It's very, very, very important. Uh, you know, a, a man alone out there in the woods can fend for himself. A woman out there in the woods, pregnant with two small children, not so much, mm -hmm. right? Becomes very uh, unwieldy um, as you come close to delivery and you have to hunt and gather and carry your children with you. So because of that, tribal construct is such that women need to stick together for survival purposes. And also that's how wisdom is passed on. And we use that in women's groups because sitting in a circle elicits that ancient, uh, you know, most ancient uh, mechanism of women sitting in a circle doing things together, preparing food, singing, praying, healing, uh, you know, giving birth, dealing with somebody who's about to die, that, that's, that's built in. And within that, you have to agree. Right? You have to just agree with the tribe, with the other women, because otherwise you're outcast. And so because of that, women are much higher in agreeableness than men. And that means that boundary function is automatically lower naturally. And the willingness to compromise for, for love is a lot um, higher. So. Now, of course, the interesting thing is that with the advent of women's liberation and uh, the workplace the way it is now, that very function is, is uh, disturbed because that environment is essentially a hunting environment. And so you need to be competitive. And so now you have women be competitive with each other who would have, that, that would have never happened like that. Yeah, you'd compete for the best resources within reason. Because the thing is, you might have gotten the man with the best resources, but then he was also the tribal leader and he got killed. And now you're out because all the other women are against you. So, you know, you, you had to play those things very carefully. And there were only a few, there's only a few outlier positions in the tribal women's construct that are not um, within that particular set of laws, so to speak, one of which is the shamaness or the sorceress. Right? That, that's a woman that's out of that uh, construct. But everyone else is in there in various degrees. And so um, when you look at women being extremely competitive in the workplace um, and in their lives and with four other women, you will see that it erodes something very strongly um, and, and it causes a certain kind of an anxiety because there's some part way back there in the crack and crevices that goes, you're going to die and you're going to die alone. Right? And, that, and that particular juxtaposition is pretty brutal when you see it in women, you know, in very competitive women. They want to be with other women, but then they can't. Right? And that tug is pretty strong. So coming back to the boundary function, um, having your heart available, meaning feeling available, and setting a strong boundary, boundary allows you to be in community without uh, being taken from or having to leave because you lost your shit and now you lashed out because you're such a pushover all the time and then, then you lose it and then you... You know, you, you, in America, they sometimes call that doormat with teeth. Yeah. You know, so you, you're walked upon, walked upon, walked upon, walked upon. You take it, you take it, you take it. And then the tenth person that comes through does the tiniest little thing and you explode. And you, you have the ten last transgression and this person's transgression. And they get it and they go, what the fuck's wrong with you? Right? I just asked, do you want candy? And you are ripping my head off. And then, of course, they have to apologize again. And then the whole thing starts again. So proper boundary function uh, saves you from that fate.
I have been teaching for 29 years total. In those 29 years of teaching, I have refined a lot of the things that you are receiving now based on just having done it over and over and over. And so I'll tell you a little bit about why we're doing what we're doing and how it all came to happen. And it starts with um, my father's uh, godfather, who was an unbelievably crazy, eccentric man, for my 12th birthday gave me the, the mists of Avalon. Some of you have heard this story before, but it's very apropos for the wild woman's circle. Um, and um, the, I, was in, I was very, very much into books. I spent all my money on books. I, I saved all my money, and then any time we went to town and uh, I could get to the bookstore, I'd buy books. And I'd start reading the moment we were in the car, and I wouldn't stop till it was done under the covers with the flashlight, didn't sleep at night, you know, those kind of things. I was obsessed with books. So The Mists of Avalon was not really material for a 12-year-old back then because I wasn't a mature 12-year-old by any means. But um, it essentially facilitated my first spiritual experience of sorts because I read that book and... You know, I, I don't know if you know the Mists of Avalon, but it's essentially very strong women doing very witchy things and being very powerful. And uh, there's lots of sex and there's lots of power and magic. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's essentially what it's about. There's also a lot of talk about reincarnation and, uh, you know, the, the, the dying and rebirthing and, and how the, the human develops over many, many lifetimes, which to me with 12 was, uh, okay, that's the way it is, and that was that. So I never questioned that ever thereafter, and my parents um, weren't perturbed by that at all because I had then decided that I was going to become a sorceress or a witch in, in those days, and uh, that I was going to pursue... Uh, becoming a sorceress uh, with great vigor. And so my parents uh, did actually find me the local herb woman, uh, a woman named Magdalena, who's still alive. She's in her late 90s now. And uh, she's a midwife and uh, she's an herbal healer. And you would probably say a naturopath by now, even though she was not formally um, medically trained. But she knew a lot more about ailments and lotions and potions and spells and things of that nature than I think most people. Uh, And she was an excellent midwife, and she pretty much uh, had uh, helped birth several generations of people in in the little village my parents moved to. And so I apprenticed with this woman any time I could. My my life back then was very simple. I went to school. I just did enough homework to get by. I got dressed in my little uh, plaid shirt and my corduroy pants and my uh, tennis shoes. That was my uniform. And then I would uh, bicycle over there where she lived, and she would take me into the woods and teach me how to wildcraft uh, and, and wild pick herbs and mushrooms and grow things and uh, put things together and then I'd go to the stables and clean horses and bake to ride the horses and then I'd go home and sleep. That pretty much was my life was 12, 13, 14 till I discovered boys of course. Uh, then the horses kind of went by the wayside. Um, but I stuck with it and um, she taught me some really interesting things because she was a midwife and she was an interesting mix because the area where I grew up in Austria is Celtic by origin, but it's, of course, Catholic. So all the things she taught me were kind of, I didn't notice back then, but when you read Rudolf Steiner, you know who Rudolf Steiner is? It was all Steiner stuff, like, you know, how biodynamic things, how you do things with the moon. And then she taught me all kinds of, like, um, spells around water and herb making and potion making that were Celtic. But they had kind of a Catholic Christian thing to it. So it was this very odd thing. Like, for instance, she taught me scrying on Easter. So, you know, it was like this weird mix of things. And when I was 16, she 
um, said that uh, I should learn about Indian Ayurvedic herbs, and she knew this woman she had met, uh, you know, a year or so before then, uh, who was Indian, who was just in Austria for a year and a half or so because her husband uh, was uh, a software, big software guy who was outfitting some Sony plant in Salzburg where I lived. And so she sent me to this woman, and this woman took me under her wing, and that is the woman who became my main teacher, a woman named Deepa. And uh, she then proceeded to take over from where Magdalena left off and taught me chai making, uh, mostly. So I had to learn how to uh, make chai by first feeling, then weighing, then grinding, then eventually mixing all the different kinds of uh, spices that can go into chai, eating them, working with them. And uh, via the chai making, she taught me uh, you know, a few very important things, amongst them concentration, sticking with things, uh, doing very ordinary things, uh, very empty, so, you know, kind of taking myself out of the equation. Of course, I didn't know any of these things. She essentially taught me how to make chai. She taught me how to wash dishes really well. And I did a lot of dishes both at her house and at my parents' house. And um, sweeping. So there was lots and lots of sweeping uh, happening. She had an oak tree in her yard, and it needed constant, the courtyard needed constant sweeping, and I swept, and I made chai, and I washed dishes for years and years and years. <laughs> hmm? uh, two, two and a half, two, yeah, about. Um, and then by the time I was 18, she started teaching me other things, um, a lot of chanting, musical things, movement, um, and some of you have heard the story before because she also taught me internal work with my center channel, my, the center line of my body, which became in, in later years nonlinear movement, which some of you have learned uh, in teacher training and otherwise. So Deepa had a, a way of instructing me that made very little sense from the outside and made, made very, very little sense to me. And there's still moments where I'm going, oh, finally understand why she made me do this now you know, 30 years later, or more than 30 years later. So I, I turned out, do you have a question? Well, it's a combination of circumstances, I would say. Um, I have a very specific disposition that makes me very, I'm very, very stubborn, very, very stubborn, and I'm very, very loyal. And I'm also oriented very strongly towards practice or in service. So I had a very strong feeling that she had things and she gave me enough, but only when I actually applied myself. She gave me enough that I always felt that there was a lot to have gotten. And at the same time, I also understood that I had to actually pay my dues. Right. And my parents were the same way. <coughs> I had, I had, I had um, parents who... I, they didn't give me anything. I had to actually apply myself, you know, for for my parents to support certain things or give me certain things. And so I think my disposition made it so that I wanted to really go there. And I had a very strong devotional disposition even back then. And um, she taught me things like, I was, and I still am, for those of you who know me, I have an enormous amount of animals. Um, you know, I loved animals. And so one of the things Magdalena had taught me uh, was how do you move in the forest without making any sound? And so that you could be, you know, could feel and, and, and see animals very up close. And so I did that. I learned how to stalk deer, and mostly deer, because Austria doesn't have much wild animals. And so then uh, one of the things Deepa taught me once I had mastered sweeping to a, to a point where I could do so empty, one of the first things she taught me was then to feel where animals were. Right? So she'd, uh, she'd take me to the pond, and she taught me how to feel into the water and how to feel where the fish were and where in the forest certain animals were and birds and things like that. And eventually 
um, taught me how to walk blindfolded through the forest and feel animals without seeing them. And so that kind of stuff really, really, really fascinated me. And I wanted more of that. And that's, I think when I really think back on it, that was one of my main motivations why I stayed because I was so into that kind of stuff. And uh, eventually uh, when I was uh, uh, older than 18, she was very careful there. She, even though the, uh, in Austria, it's a bit different, but she didn't teach me any even remotely sexual practices or even pointed me in that direction till I was 18. And then eventually, over the years, I had a, a full education in the realms of the, you know, both devotional and actual, actual sexual aspects of that particular lineage, which is all filtered through deity yoga, which some of you have learned with me. And... Um, and certain kinds of movements and certain kinds of practices that prepare both the body and, and kind of the emotions for it. So over time, I knew that I was getting really amazing things. Um, but in the beginning, it was mostly, you know, I was just into it. So that all said, uh, the lineage deeper came from, and the lineage that I'm now holding is only women. And it's only given from woman to woman. And so... There's a very strong emphasis on women's practice, right? Women's practice, both in the aspect of how do you work with a woman's body? How do you have a woman's body? You know, how do you work with your body in accordance with nature, which is a very big thing? Uh, how do you feel your body? You know, everything from how do you feel when you ovulate to, you know, much more esoteric things. And so... There were other women who were also her students while I, she was not a formal public teacher, but she had at any given time while I was with her between six and I think the maximum was 10 women. So we did a lot of things together and we did a lot of things with the other women and there were always two or three people at the house uh, anytime I went there. There were, you know, other women. So cut to much, much later in, in, um, in my development when I had moved to L.A. At that point, I had uh, you know, finished all my university education. and I, had a, I was on a Jungian track at the University of Vienna. You can do Freudian or Jungian. And I did Jungian. And so in Jungian psychology, uh, you, ha you have a few areas you can go in. You can go into dreams. Uh, you can go into shadow stuff and you can go into archetypal stuff. And I started with dreams and then realized that really the, the thing that I was most passionate about was the archetypal work because it's very similar to deity yoga. It's a different orientation, but it has the same access where you are looking at archetypes as I did in, in my lineage, uh, looking at deities as... Uh, an expression of something that's there for all of us. And so the, the deity yoga and the archetypal work wove together really nicely, and I was very fascinated by how can you embody archetypes and how do you take them, because Jungian psychology, of course, is super, super heady. There's nothing embodied about it whatsoever. So I just wanted to know how could you um, translate that into embodied practice. How can you move with that? How do you, how do you express that? And so that was kind of my exploration for quite a few years. And then I moved to LA and found myself uh, with knowing one person. And once again, you know, it's the same question that Sylvia asked, why the hell did I stick with it? Well, uh, mostly stubbornness, I'd say, because I did not want to admit that I couldn't do it, right, and go back home. So I essentially went from knowing one person to building a business, and in, in that case, back then it was counseling. So I'd start at 6 in the morning and I'd end at midnight, and it was all just survival at that point. So I decided I was going to do a women's group. And so I, I invited the four women I knew. At that point, I knew four women, uh, three of which were my clients and one of which was a friend. And um, I started a women's group 
uh, in what then was uh, my garage in West Hollywood, which I had converted into a little tiny, it was a one and a half um, car garage probably that I had converted into a yoga studio. So it had you know, nice floors and I had the walls painted yellow and still had the rafters and the, the, the garage door, but that was my studio. And so from then on, every week, in the beginning every week and then every second week, for 15 years pretty much, taught um, many of the things that I had been taught in some variation and adjusted things and uh, kept that up for a long, long time. And of course, when you teach every other week and then, you know, later when I started traveling more, it was like once a month, you have to constantly come up with new stuff and constantly uh, refine the stuff and make it interesting again. And the material that you are getting now is essentially the distilled and and refined versions of the things that I've been working with ever since then. So I'm 50 now. I started this particular material when I was 26. And uh, so it's been refined, refined, refined. The first 20 to 30 percent are uh, accessible under they are the only thing that precludes the first 30 percent of what there is to be accessible is if you're not capable of doing it right up to that point or at that point specific practice and the demonstration of that practice is needed before the next thing can be given so like for instance there's a few women in here they are in the third round of ongoing study groups. So they are now in areas that are in the lineage, in the, in the, in the um, transmission piece that's no longer available to just anyone. You have to demonstrate practice over and over and over and over. And then those things are often transmission-based. So they get, to, they, they get something by me having demonstrated it, and then they work with that. But this material is the preparation for all of those things. And it's completely freestanding in itself. You don't have to want to uh, participate in a lineage or lineage teachings. You can simply use them for embodiment and expression and learning how to express you know, in your body, through your body. She you know, revealed it all very, very slowly and carefully. There wasn't much, uh, okay, this is who I am, this is what's happening. It was essentially you only got the next thing when you had become proficient at the, the, the thing before. Well, because you were asking, all the things that you're getting here is a combination of the things I was taught that I um, translated into this kind of material because my path is a very different path than the path of my teacher, right? And... I didn't have any idea that I was going to take the lineage further. Right? That wasn't ever discussed. I wasn't oriented towards that, but I was always very oriented towards teaching. And I, what I did, I, oh, we, we counted it at some point, over 40,000 client hours of counseling in my lifetime so far. Right? So I did an enormous amount of being with people in the realm of uh, relationship and embodiment and empowerment and in the midst of that started teaching both the women's work and uh, the couple's work or the, the polarity work and you know various versions of embodiment and so I wasn't aware that the lineage was going to be handed to me so my orientation was the, the orientation of a public teacher a counselor and a public teacher and I did that uh, in my way for many years. And then when she died um, three years ago, a little bit more than three years ago, she had an accident, uh, one of those horrific Indian bus accidents where, you know, there's, there's some full-on collision. And she was uh, alive for over a week before she died. Uh, and she was very uh, coherent in, in the days up to her death for many reasons that I don't want to go into. But I essentially received a Skype call and 
uh, got on Skype and was essentially told, it's, you know, it's yours, you must take it further. She gave me a few instructions, that was the end of that. And then three days later she died. And uh, a couple of months later I received a, a box with some of her things and some of her writings and a little bit of her music and that was the end of that. And then it was like, holy shit. Well, first it wasn't holy shit. First it was like, oh, well, okay. Uh, and then, you know, over, uh, I don't know, a couple of months probably, we would talk about it right? and, and Steve would start asking questions and essentially in the course of him asking me questions and, and, and being very specific in the questions he asked, it dawned on me that I essentially had to orient my life towards finding a successor because I couldn't possibly or I can't imagine that I want to let the lineage die. You know? But I had never taught with that in mind. I had taught simply because that's what you do. You teach workshops, people come, they have a good time, then they leave. Maybe they'll come back if it was a great workshop, maybe they don't. The people who want to learn something try and come and learn something, then they steal your shit, leave, uh, replicate your stuff somewhere else, and then new people come and you create new stuff and then that gets stolen and that's that's essentially the life of an itinerant workshop teacher if you're good, right? People take your stuff and move along. And so Steve uh, pointed towards the education piece and the piece that you are now enjoying, which is a disposition towards sharing it all and giving it actually away so it can be used in its current form, which is how I adapted it or, or worked with it with, through my own practice. And in my lineage, that's the way it's always been done. Whoever takes it further adapts it to their own set of circumstances. Uh, the whole teaching philosophy of the Wild Woman's Way and with that the Wild Woman's Circle, it is geared towards uh, non-imposition. Right? And that's to me, very important. And uh, as you know, for those of you who know uh, us, you know, is Steve's mainstay. And he's, uh, you know, very, very good at that and very uh, um, adamant at that, which really helps with this material where you just don't impose the commonly used stereotypes onto people. And it doesn't matter what stereotype that is. It doesn't matter if it's the goddessy sparkle thing or the uh, wannabe tantrika thing or the uh, we're all um, hardcore feminists who can do for our own on our own or any other version thereof. You're not you you're steering very far away from that, and you ac you're offering actual empowerment, and that is f learning f to feel and understand and express one owns, one's own expression of being a woman, right? one's own feminine, one's own um, natural bodily genius, however that looks. But in California, the whole women's group scene is essentially, unless you have a perfect yoga body uh, and the perfect age, and the perfect sparkly outfit, and you go to Burning Man, and you know how to also do hula hoop and cacao ceremonies, you are essentially useless as a, as a woman's group uh, attendee or facilitator. Right? And of course, that's absolutely not true. And one of the things that I'm personally very, very proud of is that any time I teach, you'll find who was just, you were just a desolate. Uh, the youngest woman was 21, the oldest was in her early 70s. And in Ojai, we have a woman who is, what, 84? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. In an ideal world, it would be lovely if um, there are people, and, there are, and every single one of you has the potential, who can learn that body of work or that lineage to the point that they can bring it forth. But I'm not actively sniffing about, is she the one? Is she the one? Is she the one? And it's, not, it's not one of those situations. People start uh, entering practice and it becomes very apparent what they're about. 
And the nice thing about the way I was taught and the nice thing that is now afforded to me courtesy of this and courtesy of the longer study groups is that I can look at each woman that I'm working with and see her disposition and hopefully further that instead of cookie cutter molding people into something that looks like me or my teacher or something like that. But I can, I can foster like my teacher did with me in each person the, the, the direction or the talent they have. There is very, very strong attention to very mundane activity, like really mundane activity, right? Sweeping and dishwashing and... Um, uh, uh, haven't we all, right? Yes, and, 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 and there is something... We, and because we've done loads of that, all of us, the entry through that, like the, the, the empty you know, activity that, that just feeds itself... Is, a, is very useful because there is so much mundane things. And of course, it's a women's lineage, so you have to imagine, supposedly the lineage is about 2,000 years old, so you have to imagine every single woman in that lineage has done a shitload mm. of laundry, yes. a shitload of pounding grain and making chapatis and, you know... But that becomes the practice, right? The sacred ordinariness, where, where the, where that, the drudgery of a woman's existence, which is the most definitely very present in India, even though, of course, the women in my lineage, um, from what I know, right, that the stories I know and, and the things I know, um, have had fairly extraordinary, fairly extraordinary lives in, in the, in the bigger context of India. But, however, still householder lives that involved an enormous amount of toil and hardship and really, really boring, you know, mundane activities and housework, housework, more housework, raising children often, right? Not, not always, but often raising children. So that, that's a big access point, and it has a very strong ritual and a very strong shamanic um, bend to it you know and and uh you know with that of course there's a lot of kind of secret hidden and yeah. quite gnarly uh gnarly is such a california word i've lived in california too long you know what gnarly is in california they say gnarly when when there's a very very big wave that will crush you that's a, it's a surfer term you know that you grew up in Santa Cruz, right? So yes, so uh, it's a pretty uh, rough kind of um, heavy-duty engagement with pretty dark stuff. So those are some of the the the, the thing. But the real, you know, the, the the real mainstay is the engaging with life. You know, that the fullness of the engagement with life, and that, of course. Uh, requires an enormous amount of willingness to embody and feel and be with that, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's, that. there's some other fun stories which we can get to another time. 